Today's uh, text for the message comes from Matthew 18, verses uh, 23 through the rest of that chapter. So if you have a Bible, or if it's on your phone, uh, or if you know the passage, just follow along with me. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began to settle uh, the settlement, a man who owed 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell upon his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay off the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tormented, tortured, until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Let's pray. Lord, be with us now. Pray that we would hear your message to us through these words. Pray that my words would be pleasing and acceptable to you. In your name I pray, amen. If you know the story of Les Mis, this is actually the first play that uh, I went to with my now wife on our first date. It took her to see Les Mis. I knew nothing about it. And um, it was a little awkward. We had to end up actually running through the st streets of London to find this theater and get there, and I'm a sweaty mess, and it's kind of a disaster, and I'm nervous because I'm on a date. And so I'm not really paying attention, but the story of Les Mis unfolds, and it's, it's about, uh, the main character's name is Jean Valjean, and he's a prisoner. The story opens with him in prison. He's been in prison for 19 years because he stole a loaf of bread. It's a long time to be in prison for stealing a loaf of bread. He's eventually released, and uh, he goes about his life, and, um, but he finds, a hard, he finds it difficult to get a job, in part because he's an ex-con. So what happens is a bishop takes him in and cares for him and loves him and begins to try and sort of nurture him back. And in response, Jean Valjean steals a whole bunch of the bishop's silver and runs away. He's caught by the police. The police bring him back to the bishop and expect the bishop to say, hey, you know, how dare you? Give me, my, give me my silver back and go back to prison. But that's not what the bishop says. The bishop says, oh, no, 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 police, you don't understand. That was actually a gift. In fact, not only that, but you forgot two silver candlesticks here. Take these with you and go. And he says this to the man. He says, God has had mercy on you. Go and live a noble, honest life. So in the story that we have here, we see this similar picture of mercy that is remarkably similar and striking. The context here is the story about forgiveness. What's going on prior to this passage is Jesus has gone through the whole transfiguration we see some of the questions from his disciples turning more heavenward. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus responds by telling the story about letting the little children come to him. And then the topic turns to forgiveness. And Peter asks, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? Jesus says, no, 70 times seven, meaning innumerable times. Our whole purpose is to be forgiving others. The audience that we have that Jesus is speaking to are kingdom members. So he's talking to people who understand the grace of God, who are part of that group that is following Jesus, who show fidelity to him. And the overarching parable that we have in this, um, the, the overarching point of this parable is that because of God's great mercy and forgiveness to us, we're to respond in kind. The parable falls into three major categories. The first is, 
uh, is the story that, um, of, of the king and the servant. We see here that God's mercy and forgiveness is what restores us. As the parable goes on, we see that God's mercy and forgiveness is that which compels us. And it ends with God's mercy and forgiveness is that which convicts us. So as we open up to the very first part of the passage here, we see that there's the king and he comes across, you know, it's time for him to settle up some, some debts with some of his servants. And the one that we have here is, uh, we're, we're told that he owes 10,000 talents. I don't know about you, maybe you know this off the top of your head. I didn't, so I had to do a little research. 10,000 talents is the equivalent to an enormous sum of money. In modern terms, some scholars put it somewhere between six or 60 million to hundreds of millions of dollars, even billions of dollars, depending on how you do the math. So you have the servant who owes an enormous sum of money to the king. And the king says, you owe this to me, pay it back. And the servant says, I can't. So he says, fine, I'm gonna, I'm gonna liquidate everything that you have in your life. Your wife, your children, everything that you own, we're gonna sell and we're gonna get rid of it. How does the servant respond? He responds by making kind of an absurd claim. He says, give me some time, please be patient. I promise I'll pay back the billions and billions of dollars that I owe you. What a remarkably foolish thing to say. There's absolutely no way that this servant could pay back the debt. Yet somehow he believes that he's capable of pulling himself out of this mess and making things right on his own. The king's response is equally remarkable. It's immensely gracious and forgiving. He just forgives the debt and says, go, get out of here. Your, your debt is forgiven. The servant did nothing to earn this. This is the story of the gospel, is it not? We all have an enormous debt to pay with our sin. None of us can dig ourselves out of the debt that we owe. And yet there's this free gift that's given to each of us. The explicit expectation here, of course, is the fact that as a result of this free gift of grace, we would go on and live accordingly, showing that same grace to others. But of course, as the parable goes on, we see that that's not the case. As we transition to the second part of the parable, it's reminding me of the other character, one of the other main characters in the story of Les Mis, Javert. And Javert is the detective. He's the policeman who's there at the time when Jean Valjean is released initially. And th over the course of the story, it's the the underlying plot is that Javert is pursuing Jean Valjean, wanting to make things right, feeling like he didn't quite pay all of the debt that he owed, that his prison sentence was commuted a little too early. He's legalistic. He wants justice at all costs. And we see a similar thing happening with the servant who was just given enormous grace and mercy and forgiveness. Now it's his turn to play the role of the person who is owed a great deal of money. One of his servants owes 100 denarii. Again, maybe you know what that means. I didn't, I had to look it up. Denarii is significantly less money. In fact, ratio-wise, it's the equivalent to 600,000 to one, the debt that he owed versus the debt that now his servant owes him. So for every penny that his servant owes, that master's debt was $6,000 in equivalent terms today. That servant can't pay. So what's the response now of the one who has just shown immense mercy? He chokes him and demands repayment. On the one hand, the, the response is somewhat justified. He was owed money. He was owed some sort of payment. But what makes the response so reprehensible and so absurd is the fact that he was just demonstrated a significantly greater grace than he's willing to extend to that person who owes him something. It's actually punctuated by the fact that the way that the appeal for mercy is given to this master is the exact same words that he used before the king who forgave him a significantly greater debt. His sense of personal justice completely runs over any sense of mercy that he may have. How could he be forgiven so much 
and yet fail to forgive so little. That servant fails to see that God's forgiveness compels us to forgive others. God's mercy compels us to respond with mercy and forgiveness towards others. And we see this finalizing in the last part of the parable here. Towards the end of the story of Les Mis, you see these repeated encounters between the two characters we've been talking about. Jean Valjean, the former convict who's been freed, who's gone on to live a a noble life. He took seriously the charge of the bishop to go and live an honest life, to do good, to be merciful. And so there's a, a series of instances where he saves different people's lives. He restores broken relationships. He gives of himself far more than he takes. And at the end of the story, there's actually this scene where the roles are a bit reversed. You have Jean Valjean, the ex-convict, actually having in his own custody the man that's been pursuing him for all these years, Javert. The context is the story of the French Revolution, and the expectation here with Javert being a spy is that Jean Valjean would take him into an alley and kill him. And so he does. He takes him into an alley, but instead of firing the gun at Javert, he fires it into the ground and sends Javert, the inspector, on his way, free. He shows mercy to the man who had been pursuing him for so long. Javert, shortly thereafter, actually ends up having Jean Valjean back in custody. He finally has his moment. He finally has his opportunity. He's been chasing this man his entire life. The debt that Jean Valjean owed could finally be repaid. But he's tormented between this sense of duty and justice on the one hand and the mercy that he's experienced on the other. So his decision eventually is to let Valjean go. Forgiveness isn't easy, but it's required. The fact of the matter is we've all been hurt. We've all been hurt deeply. Some of the hurts and the wounds that we've experienced from those in our life have changed the nature of our life or the direction of our life or the quality of our life forever. Forgiveness shouldn't, the easiness of forgiveness, is there is no such thing. The difficulty of forgiving someone who has hurt us can't be diminished. But we also can't ignore the imperative that we have to forgive. In our struggle or reluctance to forgive, God's mercy convicts us. It's easy to forget the fact that we're just like that first servant with an amount of debt that's owed that we could never repay. And yet we sometimes find ourselves in his shoes being unwilling or finding it very difficult to forgive a debt that's so much smaller to someone who has wronged us. How in the world can we withhold forgiveness when we have been forgiven so much? This is the king's question at the end of the passage here. In verse 33, you'll see it. He says, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? A lot of the translations here soften the language a little bit. Almost like you really should have done that. But the Greek is actually a lot more forceful. It says, isn't it mandatory? Isn't it required that you be merciful because I've been merciful to you? The expectation is real and it's forceful and it's compulsory that we have mercy on those just as Christ has had mercy on us. Part of receiving mercy and part of forgiving others is ultimately how it reflects what God has done in and through us. In giving mercy, the the focus is not so much on what we have done. The focus is not so much on a need that we have to benefit ourselves before the Lord, to show that we are somehow in right standing, but to communicate the very grace and forgiveness that we have experienced ourselves. That's the expectation here. And we see that actually throughout the Gospel of Matthew. In the Sermon on the Mount, we see, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. 
In the Lord's Prayer, we read, forgive us our sins, as we've just read this morning, forgive us our sins, as we also have forgiven those who have sinned against us. Shortly thereafter, just a couple of verses later, Jesus says, if you forgive others, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. It's a difficult lesson to learn, but it's actually the very last passage of this or the last verse of this passage, we see what happens here. Jesus says a similar thing. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. It's difficult to understand this, and scholars are trying to reconcile in many ways. How is it that a God can seem to pull back forgiveness when it seems like he initiated it in the first place? This is actually the, the as, as I was preparing for this, I had a conversation with Dr. Lamerson, and it was only then that I realized that this was the passage that he wrote his PhD dissertation on. So hopefully he can forgive me for any sort of <laughs> missteps I'm making here. Um, and if you have any questions, you should go ask him afterwards. <laughs> but the point of this is it, it's an overstatement. We shouldn't presume an underlying reality underneath the king's commands here that he's as if God has some sort of torturers the whole point is it's a parable. It's telling a story and it's overstating the point here to, to tell the shocking truth. That because we have been forgiven, we are expected to forgive others. Failure to do so brings judgment. It brings condemnation. It's, in a word, sin. And it's not how Christians behave. It's not how kingdom-minded people who have experienced this kind of grace behave to one another. I can't help but think as I do this, I always try and tie it in somehow to our, our time here at Knox and, and the purpose that we have here. And one of the questions that's been going through my mind is how our mission as a school relates to all the different things that we do here. And if you remember Knox's mission is to train men and women to declare and demonstrate the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in this passage here, I feel like we've got a very clear sense of that, a very clear direction between not just declaring the goodness of Christ, but also the requirement to demonstrate that, that goodness, that mercy, and that forgiveness that we've experienced to others in our life. Pray with me, if you will. Father, we, think, we are thankful for your forgiveness. We are thankful for your mercy. And we ask, Lord, that you would be patient with us, that you would move in us, that we may in turn be merciful to others for your glory as we seek to light, live in light of your grace and be conformed more and more into the likeness of your Son, in whom and through whom we experience that forgiveness in the first place. In your name I pray, amen. Thank you.